This sitcom touched a chord with its sweet and sincere storytelling. Recently, it cleaned up on the award circuit and was named Best Comedy Series by the Canadian Screen Awards, GLAAD Media Awards, Golden Globe Awards, Primetime Emmy Awards, SAG Awards, and so many more. The list seriously goes on forever. We're honored to have its creator joining us today. Here's our own Virginia Love with writer, director, producer, and winner of MTV and Critics' Choice Acting Awards, Dan Levy. So I think a lot of people think that Schitt's Creek just came out of nowhere as this cultural phenomenon, but it really wasn't that sort of instant success. Like if you're an early watcher, you may have seen it on Canada, on the Canadian broadcast channel. But like, tell us a little bit about initially developing the concept and then when the fans got involved and really propelled it to a completely different level. Yeah, I mean, we were a, we, we, we ha we're a very small show, period. <laughs> from beginning to end. I think people think that once you become a successful show that somehow you're operating with a much bigger budget. That was not the case for us because our show was small. It was small in the sense that we were on uh, the Canadian national sort of television network and then we were on a very small, teeny tiny network in America called mm -hmm. Pop TV, long before Pop Netflix came, yeah. came into the picture. So what we were doing in those early years was kind of amazing because we didn't have this giant expectation of like being on, I don't know, some major American network with a thousand eyes on us and you know, we had to perform each week in order to stay on the air. We were then we were really able to take those first few years and find out what the show was all about without those the fear of expectation, without the weight of a huge financial burden that we were carrying. And I think that was really cool because it allowed for this slow burn for people to sort of find the show and feel like they were, that they had discovered something, that it wasn't just yeah. something that was presented to them. But our fans, I think for the most part, feel like in the early days, they discovered something that a lot of people didn't know about. And I think when you feel that sense of ownership over something, it really ties you to whatever that thing is in a slightly more meaningful way. Um, so it was, it, I wouldn't have had it any other way. I think at the time we were passed by most networks in America. It's hard not to take that as a, a bit of a blow to the ego, but things happen the way they happen. And I think to have had a more grassroots approach to making television allowed for a level of authenticity I don't think we would have had if we had gone with a major American network. So everything That's happens true. for a reason. And it's amazing to now be able to connect the dots on all of it and, and realize that sometimes what you think is a failure actually was an open door to, to another kind of success. Yeah, yeah. just I, when I watched it, I th thought that when you rewatch some of the episodes after the fact or like when you've been on some of the entertainment channels and you see just the craze behind it, it, it's, it feels really overwhelming, which is super fun. It's got to be fun for you and the cast. So a couple of the elements that you use in storytelling in um, Schitt's Creek are things like the clothes and the hair and the makeup play such a huge part. Um, art, cultural references that are just countless. You know, our clients' property management teams are also storytellers. They're trying to get people to live at their properties and they're trying to sort of give them an idea of what the experience is going to be like. As a writer and a storyteller, can you give us an idea of like how do you use those elements to sort of layer in to your story and deliver this genius product to the public? Well, I think it starts with just really understanding what it is you want to say. Um, and for me, it was going to be a visual journey as much as it was going to be a, 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 a kind of dialogue-driven journey. I wanted the aesthetic of the show to be just as important as the lines that we say. And also, when you're a writer, exposition is not a very nice thing to have to write. It's, it's always better to show something than to have a character say something. I don't love when characters have to describe who they are and what they stand for. I'd rather have that reveal itself over the course of their behavior and what they choose to wear and, and, and the kinds of things they choose to say instead of the directness of, of expositional dialogue. So when you get to dress a, a cast in you know designer clothes, beautiful architectural high fashion, and then put them in this very small town that is so not in any way stylish, 
I was then able to continually tell the story of how out of place this family was without really having to have the characters describe that discomfort. So it was, I think it was a clarity of focus like anything. When you really know what you want to do, you find really innovative and creative ways of getting there. Um, I find that, you know, when the concept is a little bit less specific, that's when you need to start squeezing things in in weird ways and and the authenticity of the experience the authenticity of the idea somehow gets muddied because it's just not strong enough or it's not ready enough to be presented to somebody so i don't necessarily know how that pertains to what your the in terms of property management but i guess there is a common thread in terms of you know a specificity of presenting someone with an idea and making sure that they believe that idea wholeheartedly, that they, you know, in the in the sense of property, that people want to, as you were saying, spend time in a place, yes. in a meaningful way, invest in a place yes. in a meaningful way, um, and that they don't have any sort of trepidation about that. Did you learn anything about leadership as you directed the show? Yeah, I mean, you know, as a director, you you're you're. you're sort of assuming the whole visual journey of of the episode and on top of that you're also having to guide actors which is very different from sitting down on a production meeting saying okay i need a b c and d by thursday do we think we can get this done you can't speak to actors with the same kind of frankness or with the same kind of um technicality that you could in another kind of part of the job so I think it were it helped that I was an actor as well because I had I understood how how different it is to speak to an actor. Actors don't necessarily have, you know, the same kind of technical mind as a production designer. It's a lot more sensitive and it's a lot more create, you know, not creative, but but um, you know, their face is going out to the world. So right. certain conversations whether it's a note that you want to implement, whether you want to have an actor try a different you know, way of saying a line or shift the the intention of what the scene is, those kinds of conversations have to be ultimately more conversational than you might have with anybody else. And and so understanding that everyone you speak to in a day has to be spoken to, you know, in a different context depending on what their sure. job is. So that was a big that was a big thing and, and I really loved directing. I loved, you know, um, getting behind the camera and, and learning about lenses and learning about blocking and all of these sort of amazing behind the scenes details that you don't really get to learn about as, as an actor when actor, you show up. Yeah. You know, you kind of do through a, a, a level of just osmosis, but to be there and to have my crew and my director of photography, you know, walk me through with such care and such sensitivity in those early days of my first few episodes directing, you know, I really had a, a wonderful team of people around me helping me and, and wanting me to succeed. So that was that was key. That's great. You know, here at Entrada, our culture and values are the foundation of our success and they are in everything that we do, at, whether it's in the office or with clients and with customers, everything we do, it stems from those um, culture and the values. For example, we have values that are a business in the front, party in the back, or be the Joneses, and those kind of fun things that just constantly remind us who we are. Um, what culture and values define the set of, of Schitt's Creek? Did you have anything that was sort of like a mantra or something y'all all rallied around? I think it was it was really like a go team thing. I think the choice to, to call us a team was, was something that I felt was a necessary thing. Um, I think when you have such an uphill battle in our case, which is, you know, trying to get a show that it was originally on two very small networks out there to the world, because obviously you want more and more people to see it. Um, as I said, it requires a lot of work. And so for our team now to be able to, and some of them worked worked with us for all six seasons. We had people yeah. come back season after season after season, which is very rare in television. Um, it was because they felt a part of a team, and they were. Um, you know, 
so when we do win a bunch of Emmys, it's not me winning. It's, I mean, it is technically, but it's <laughs> the letters I received, the emails I received from everyone on our cast and crew. People felt a sense of ownership over it because it was a team effort. And it was important that they knew it coming from me and that they didn't just see me walking around taking credit for everyone's work because I simply can't do that. So the team concept was so crucial, I think, and it allowed for departments to work with each other in ways that they never normally did before. It allowed for a level of conversation with, of honesty um, within the within just the infrastructure of creating our crew that that um, hopefully made everyone feel valued and necessary. So that when they show up at 5.45 in the morning to start a day, or even earlier in certain circumstances, they're doing it because they really believe in what they're here to, to do. Um, so no mantras necessarily, but definitely <laughs> definitely a team spirit. There was a lot of photos that were taken over the course of each season that would then get printed and tacked up on the walls. You know, it, we called it, I mean, I guess we called it summer camp because we, yeah. we started in April and we ended in June and... The seasons would turn from spring to summer, and, and by the time we were in June, the end of May, June, we were out on location in farmland in Ontario in Canada, you know, shooting this television show. And it did feel like for three months out of the year, our cast and crew got to come back together and have fun. And so, yeah, it was, a, it was summer camp. Okay, so Schitt's Creek is notable for its inclusivity, but it never felt preachy or like you were pushing an agenda. Um, were you conscious of that? Is that something that you that you really thought about, or did it happen more like organically? Uh, no, it was pretty considered. I think, um, as a gay person, um, I was pretty exhausted by the lack of um, diversity of storytelling. You know, like a lot of queer television is either something that is quite tragic, ends in a kind of horrible, sad, tragic conclusion, um, or it's, it's a lesson to be learned. And I don't, I didn't want to touch on either of those. I felt like the shows that had touched upon the tragedy um, had, for the most part, done it in a really thoughtful and interesting and mm -hmm. meaningful way, and I wanted them to tell those stories. I thought we had, a, had an, a, um, an opportunity to tell a slightly more casual story about life. You know, I just wanted, I didn't want the stories that we were telling, you know, between David and Patrick to feel othered in any way because I've grown up watching so many straight relationships play out on television with no questions asked. Why couldn't I write a story that was just as casual mm -hmm. as, you know, as Ross and Rachel? Um, and so that's what I did. And I think at the time, I didn't quite understand how rare it was to have stories like that. I mean, I, I knew it was, I knew I hadn't seen them that often, but I didn't quite understand, you know, because the, it's since been described as, as like revolutionary, which to me is, is not a compliment because it shouldn't be revolutionary. I'm just telling the story of, of something that I hold really close to my own experience and my friends' experiences. That's not a revolutionary thing, that's life. And so I think what's a little bit scary is the fact that we're still at a place where those stories aren't in abundance, where we haven't gotten to the point where words like revolutionary are, are you know, have to be used to used describe to something so simple. And so, you know, not to reduce it to something, but so ordinary in a good way. Um, so yeah, I did. I did, certainly didn't intend to to change conversations with it. I I just wanted to tell funny and meaningful stories about uh, you know my community in a way that felt truthful and and honest and hopeful. So production wrapped up on Schitt's Creek in 2019, and then 2020 we all went down for lockdown. Right. So what was that adjustment like for you personally? Uh, I mean, it was I, I. It wasn't easy for a variety of reasons. I think there was, you know, there was a lot going on culturally. There was a lot going on socially. There was a lot yep. going on um, in terms of just 
health and safety. It was a lot to um, to try and detangle in terms of where to put your efforts, where to spend your energy, what to you know what to take from it all. Mm-hmm. I feel like the past year has, I think, inspired me to do more generally um, with myself, with the you know platform I've been given. Um, with my free time, with how I spend my time with and money and, and where I put my efforts. Um, you know, I, and I also think I learned over the course from, a, from an entertainment standpoint that we had made something through the show that, that I think a lot of people in quarantine felt a, a, a kind of closeness to. I think I heard more yes. from people over the past year than I did over the past six years. And I think when everyone was forced to be home and turning to their TVs as a form of escape to know that we had sort of created something that made people feel safe in an unsafe time or um, made them laugh when when it's, you know, what's going on outside our doors is not not very funny um, to offer a little bit of light in a in a trying time is was a pretty meaningful takeaway, I think, for all of us on the show. Um and then I think it's just really, again, informed me moving forward um, to constantly question everything that I do and make sure that I'm as as well-intentioned and as sort of inclusive in, in the storytelling and the, the, the path that I'm trying to carve for myself as possible. So um, it's been a strange year. Um, it's been a, or, you know, it's been a terrible year, really. But um, I do hope that there's been some, some real fundamental change within the entertainment industry in terms of just reconfiguring an industry that needed to be reconfigured. I gotta say, who had a better quarantine than you when it gets down to the popularity of the show, a huge captive audience, people that fell madly in love, and I think, like you said, I mean, it was just this just ray of sunshine, and when everybody just really needed a little bit of escapism, and then those awards and the accolades just keep rolling in. So we wanted to give you an opportunity to brag and just sort of kind of recap what that has felt like. You know, in a way it's been uh, humbling because you realize like without the the glitz and the glamor of award shows, it really is just receiving a, a thing. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the, the realization that it, at the end of the day, you're just getting a thing. Um, <laughs> It was yeah. was a nice, a very Canadian way of going through award season. You know what I mean? Like, what you mean? like at a table, you know, polite, yeah, with nobody else. Yeah, be, you know, egomaniacs about what we do. It's kind of keep your head down, do good work, and and you know appreciate the the goodness that comes. But so in a way, to 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 circumvent a lot of the hubbub of what award season is was um, was I think actually quite good. I did a lot, I did get to wear some nice clothes, so that was a good yes. thing. Yes. Um, but I think when you have good fortune in a year where so many people don't, it really forces you to be aware of that and to try and spread whatever success that that in my case I achieved. How do I do that? How do I fold more people into that so that you can share the success that you've been given? You can give back in meaningful ways and. And so that's really been crucial for me through this entire sort of path is, you know, for all the good that I have been fortunate enough to, to experience this year, what can I be doing to pass that forward? Um, and, you know, every day you kind of think of, of new ways and, and try and leverage whatever good has come my way to, to also you know, allow for for other people, other voices within my community, my peers to be given opportunities as well. So, you know, it's a it's it's a continuing effort, but it's it's been an odd um, an odd cross section of of joy and uh, and also understanding that, you know. Red carpet looks from people's living rooms. I mean, who ever thought, right, that sort of thing. Whole new world. I watched an interview that you did with GQ back in November of 2019, and you mentioned that you keep a notebook, and that's where you keep all your top secret ideas. And you said, you told them to follow up in a year. So it's been 18 months. Dan Levy, what do you got? We want to know what's next. 
Well, listen, it's not a single thing. I uh, that notebook had a lot of ideas in it, and we are we're we're moving forward on a bunch of them. Um, I would love to be more specific at this point, but I unfortunately cannot. But I think you know, spending six years doing scripted television, you know, I have aspirations to work in drama. I have wor- aspirations oh. to work in animation. Um, I am writing a rom-com for myself because if I don't do it, no one else will. Nope. Nobody no else will. will. That's great. Yeah. Um, that's another sort of startling realization in this industry is that, you know. The great thing about being the writer and the actor, I want to be a superhero. I want to fall in love. I want to, I want to win the lottery. Shockingly yeah. enough, if you are not a conventional leading man in Hollywood, you don't get the same amount of parts. Last thing we want to do with you today is that Vogue has their 73 questions, which you so famously answered, and it's on a video that everybody can watch on YouTube. We're going to scale that down to the Entrada 21 for 2021 and ask you 21 questions. Are you ready? Your favorite Mariah Carey song? Always Be My Baby. Of course. Signature dish, what do you cook? Uh, I only can cook one, and it's a spaghetti bolognese that is actually quite delicious. What is your go-to karaoke song? Prince's Purple Rain. I did not see that one coming. No, and I'm not a good singer, so... (laughs) It's all about the sell in karaoke. You're a good singer. Right, if you're a good singer, it wouldn't be karaoke, right? Um, What are three things you cannot live without? Bread, my dog, uh, TV right now. Oh, that's good. I like that. Um, what talent do you wish that you had? Singing. Um, best thing that happened to you during quarantine? I, um, I think, well, I guess it would be winning a, uh, watching my whole team win Emmys would be a, a pretty wonderful thing. What are you currently reading or watching that uh, is really inspiring you now? Um, I just watched the Tina Turner documentary, and that (sighs) was unbelievable. She is an absolute legend and an inspiration, and I highly encourage everyone to watch it. When do you feel your happiest? Uh, When I'm traveling. Pancakes or waffles? Both. Oh, carbs. When I'm at a brunch, I order everything because I get anxious and I want a little bit of tastes. I want to. What if I don't get something I like? I mean, that's true. That's a good one. I love that. Um, So what inspires you? Uh, Other people's passion. Um, Life. I think like, you know, when you're a writer, part of your job is observing life so that you can kind of take it in and process it and hopefully regurgitate it in a meaningful way on a page somewhere. So, you know, the the sort of the minutia, the big and small of, of just everyday life, I find That's very beautiful. inspiring. Um, between filming and you have a break, where do you go and who's going with you? Well, up until recently, I used to go to Japan every year with a couple of my best friends, and that was always the most welcome palate cleanser because I love it so much. Tokyo is my favorite city in the world, and um, I haven't been back this year, and I'm missing it dearly. So we'll see when those Ray, travel Ray to pack it up and go. Yeah. What did you want for, your, for yourself when you were 12? Probably confidence. Good Sadly. one. Sadly. Good one. Uh, name someone that's in your circle of influence that might surprise us. I... Um, well, I mean, I, we wouldn't be a circle of in. Well, I think chatting with Patrick Stewart was a very Ooh. cool thing this year. He hosted a, a little Q and A for us after we found out that he was a fan of the show, and and I sent him flowers after the um, after the Q and A, and and we started sort of chatting a little bit. And um, when I work up the courage, awesome. I might I might take him up on his dinner offer, and you know. There's, um, life has a funny way of introducing you to, to people that you have long sort of been in your, your circle of, of just fandom and, um, and people that I long admired. So that was a, that was a, a, a wonderfully full circle moment That's crazy. What do you do when you um, need to shake a lack of creativity? Uh, I, I walk around the block. 
it's a boring answer, but you know, writer's block is, is mainly yeah. just when your brain gets stuck in a in a pattern. Um, so it's you know, for me, I try to like either call it and pick it up the next morning, or I'll take like a long walk and with my dog and um, and hope that I when I come back to my desk, things are a little bit clearer. A little bit better. Um, what is the favorite movie your father has ever been in? Waiting for Guffman, I would say. That's so fun. What What is the best Canadian snack? Um, I would say, well, for those of you who have been to Canada, I would say a Tim Hortons t Timbit. They're called Timbits, and they're essentially okay. donut holes. But gotcha. I want to say they okay. were started in Canada by this company, but I don't know for sure. So don't we'll hold me to it, but a, t a Tim Hortons Timbit. Uh, here's a hard one. Um, Paul Hollywood or Mary Berry? I got to go with Mary. <laughs> me too. <laughs> 100%. What's your favorite descriptive word? Lovely. What do fans walk up and say to you when they see you or they meet you? Ew. <laughs> yes. It's That's not, what we listen, were hoping for. When I for. wrote that, I didn't expect it to catch on in the way that it did. I don't. Listen, it's flattering. I'm, they also say lovely things about the show, but for the most part, it's ooh. Yeah. It's ooh. yeah. <laughs> That's hysterical. Um, last two, what is the hardest you have ever laughed? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I have very funny friends. Probably on set. It would probably be something that we did on set, and it would probably be something that I... A game. I play a lot of games with my friends, probably game playing something in there. I wish I could be more specific, but yeah, there's a lot of laughter. Okay, last one. Best advice that you ever got that worked? Um, this is my mom's advice, and I try to employ it often, which is um, when it comes to conflict, what is your part in things? And Ooh. I, as someone who is a Leo and likes to always be right, um, when you are in a team building environment, when you're in charge of a lot of people and there's a conflict, it has been the saving grace for me to ask myself first, what is my part in this predicament? What is my part in this problem? What is my part in this conflict? Before I go and address the conflict, because at least then I have a little bit more self-awareness or I've been able to examine my place in how some something got to a certain point. And that's always diffused the tension a little bit. That's great advice. Can't think of a better way to close down this wonderful hour that we've got to spend with you. This has been such, such a treat. I cannot thank you enough for sharing your time and your talent, your your sense of humor, and your, you are truly lovely, to use your word. And um, I know that everyone in Entrada to Connect is just gonna really enjoy um, hearing what you have to say. Fingers crossed. <laughs>